This is the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and this is episode 61, When a Bitcoin Entrepreneur Goes to Prison. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I hope everyone's having a productive week and checking off all those tasks and building your free lifestyle. I'm really excited, and I know I say that a lot, but I really am this week because I've got Charlie Shrim on the show. If you're not familiar with who Charlie Shrim is, then you haven't been in the Bitcoin space for very long. He truly is an entrepreneur at heart. If he sees a problem in society, the guy is looking to build a solution. And this is truly what the entrepreneurial mindset is. Now, although Charlie is very successful as an entrepreneur, he founded BitInstant, which was one of the first Bitcoin companies. He was also the founder of the Bitcoin Foundation and much more. Unfortunately, Charlie is also really well known for being one of the few Bitcoin entrepreneurs to go to prison. The government didn't really know what Bitcoin was and and still isn't very friendly towards it and decided that Charlie was running BitInstant as an unlicensed money transmission service, which is a federal offense. After spending one year in prison, Charlie's back out Still excited about entrepreneurship and cryptocurrencies and quickly started working on new projects. We chat about Steam, the community-based blockchain, which he quickly started developing new services for, and his new business, Intellisys Capital, which is marrying traditional company stock with the blockchain. Also, don't forget that the team over at Exodus.io which is a multi-cryptocurrency desktop wallet. They're looking for a JavaScript developer for a work from home position. So if you consider yourself such, you want to experience what it's like to work from home, especially in the fast paced cryptocurrency space, then send them an email at founders at exodus.io. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Hey, Charlie, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thanks for having me, Ash. It's good to be here. I met Charlie, just a little background here, at the first Latin American Bitcoin conference down in Argentina, Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 2013, which was a blast. And since then, we've been a little bit out of touch, but I'm really glad to have you on the show. Charlie, could you catch us up with what you've been up to and, and just what your passions are in general? It's been a crazy past few years, as you as you know, and uh, about six months ago, I was released from prison. I was there for a year. Um, and it was really an enlightening experience for me because I got to spend the time uh, reading and studying. I read over 130 books. Um, but at the same time, figuring out who I am, uh, freedom, and how that's important to me. And I realized that you have to fight for your own freedoms. And you have to figure out a way to do that. You can't just expect freedom to be handed to you. I didn't want, uh, I may have had my physical liberties taken away, but I wasn't going to allow my dignity or my psychological liberty to be taken away from me. So I did my time and I didn't let the time do me. Yeah, I know it was a very interesting time back then. Bitcoin, the government didn't really know how to treat Bitcoin. And what did they, what did they charge you with? So I um, ended up serving time for aiding and abetting the operation of an unlicensed money transmitting business. So just moving money around and that's there, that's without their license, that's illegal and enough to put someone in prison. That's really sad, Charlie. And you know, you are definitely a, a Bitcoin martyr. So you've, I know you've got a lot of uh, fans out there who are rooting for you the whole time. They really were such a supportive community. Unbelievable. Compare and contrast that with the entrepreneurial world that you you're back into now because you've been an entrepreneur you're a young guy you know in your 20s you've been an entrepreneur for i mean it looks like the majority of your life how did you become an entrepreneur like wh when did it even start making sense when did you switch into that mindset and compare and contrast that with what you were able to do while in prison 
it's interesting because I started my first businesses in high school, even elementary school, fixing people's printers um, and computers. It's as simple as finding an opportunity, and if you if you can do it better than someone else, if there's demand for something, then you can provide a supply for it. So I saw a demand for people whose computers were constantly breaking down, and there was no resource. There was no, you know, someone who can show up to their house at a given moment and charge by the hour and just fix their printers or their computers or set up a network or install security cameras. So I would do that, you know, after hours, after school or on weekends, and I would charge an hourly rate. And that was really great to start doing and building a network and figuring, hey, like, this is pretty cool. I can run a business. It was really uh, fantastic. And I decided to go to college after graduating high school. And my cousin Joey came to me with an idea and he said, Hey, Charlie, like, um, we're just sitting around one Saturday and he's like, Charlie, like, it's crazy. I work in the electronics business and you know, like there has to be some way to, to make money off this, but I see, you know, uh, thousands of pallets of, of, of products that these companies haven't sold just sitting in their warehouses and taking up space. And like, what if we told these companies, like, we'll just take one day and we'll like sell a ton of their stuff and then the end of the day we just buy whatever we sold so we take no risk and i'm like well joey like you know you heard of this thing called groupon why don't we take groupon and do products with that so we called it dailycheckout.com and so what we did we went around brooklyn to all these warehouses that had tons of products so for example a digital camera they'd be hope they'd be willing to give it to us for ten dollars and instead of a, a computer company that needed to sell it for like 20 or 30 dollars we will sell it for like 12 or 13 plus shipping. So really low margins, but if we can sell a few hundred or even a few thousand, then we'd make some money. So it was only the two of us at a time. We'd list, we built a website. I built a website. Uh, we didn't even have our own warehouse. We would literally just um, sell products in a day. We'd go, we'd print out the labels. We'd package it up at their warehouse and we'd drive the products over to the UPS store. And that's what we did. And we started doing that. Um, yeah, this was while you were in college, right? This was while I was in college. I was in I was in school during the day, and then we do this at night. And the, the company became so big, we started growing. We were shipping hundreds of boxes a day. Uh, what I did was I just switched my college schedule. So I ended up going to school from 5 p.m. to like 11 p.m. And every day, five days a week, and then I would work from like 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so I was just school and work back and forth, back and forth. And that's what I did for like uh, three years. And then... Wow. I discovered Bitcoin and I was kind of, we were doing this business for three years and it was providing me like a really stable income and it was really great because I was my own boss. Me and my cousin, we were making, you know, money and, and we're happy. I was traveling and things were going good, but I was graduating college and I was kind of like, I had a year left as college and then I found Bitcoin and I fell in love with Bitcoin and I was just spending more and more of my time involved in Bitcoin and I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, the, the daily checkout, it just got kind of boring. It, it just... Right. I wasn't interested in it anymore. So, you know, uh, Joey and I decided to sell it and we found a buyer pretty quickly and we sold the company and I used that money to start BitInstant. And I started that BitInstant uh, my senior year of college and that company just blew up. Yeah, I, yeah. I barely, I barely graduated. Like I graduated, but by the skin of my teeth, my GPA went down like crazy. Oh, I'm sure. Because I just have a time, but I did graduate. <laughs> yeah, degree you, in economics. You did go for a degree in economics. I think that was in New York. Yeah, in City University, of New York. Be because you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn. Was there anything that you learned in school during your economics undergrad that gave you any additional insight into Bitcoin? Was it relatable no, at all? It was complete opposite. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, Ash, that m most schools don't teach, don't even tell you that they're are different schools of thought when it comes to economics. They teach you the modern way that we operate and that's the only way. You know, they don't, they tell, they, we talk about Keynesian, you know, and they don't even um, talk about Austrian school or the Chicago school or any of it. It doesn't exist right. in college. And, for, and it's a big problem. There are schools now that are finally um, over the past few years teaching that. But when I was in, I graduated in 2008 I mean, I don't even know that I had never even heard of the Austrian School of Economics while I was in school. And right. I have a degree in economics. It's, it's crazy.
Yeah, Ludwig von Mises, or I mean, you you may have heard about F. A. Hayek, but you know, you just don't learn this. You just don't learn that there are differing perspectives, differing economic theories, and people actively and practicing in like building out these economic theories. I mean, the Austrian theory isn't just some static theory. It's you know, it's growing as with praxeology, and we're just you know, it's it's just a real shame. You're right. I've my last interview was with a guy that you know, dropped out of college to become an entrepreneur because he just couldn't stand it anymore. He saw all of the value he was creating outside of the classroom. And he was just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's time to get out of here. Uh, I had to ask, you know, I, I didn't take, I don't think any economics classes in college, Charlie, but your answer doesn't surprise me. That's for sure. It's crazy. Let's talk about Bit Instant a little bit. Um, you created this while in college or during your transition you know, what was it about Bit Instant? What pain did you solve? And you know, where did you get the idea? And how did you start implementing that? So I was I was browsing the uh, I had my own troubles buying and selling Bitcoin in the early days in 2011. There was no there was no like real way to do it um, besides for these kind of exchanges. And I mean, most people don't want to use an exchange. They want to simply be able to buy something and sell it just instantly. Um, and exchange involves opening accounts and then wiring money. I mean, the modern American do- has never even sent a wire transfer in his life. No it doesn't, doesn't even do that. When you set off your first wire transfer from your bank, if you've never done it before, the bank won't even let you do it. You'll have to like go in at the bank and do it there. It's a hassle. Yeah. It's um, expensive. It takes time. And the lo- likelihood of it reaching where you're trying to send, it's very low. <laughs> and and the, I got that likelihood because he, the the actual exchange – their bank account got shut down the day I sent them a wire transfer at Trader. Oh, no. And so I had to call uh, them. And I called Jared Kenna up, and we became instantly friends. But we were we would just talk on the phone. And he actually, he refunded me and credited the account. But he was you know cool about it. But still, like the hassle that I had to go through, and it wasn't even his fault. Um, I, I put it in the back of my head. I said, all right, maybe there's a business model for, for me to figure something out down the road. Um, and I had this issue with Trade Hill myself. So what had happened was I was browsing the Bitcoin talk forums uh, one late one night and I saw someone made a post and someone made a post and he said, hey, um, I have an issue with Trade Hill. And I was like, oh, I have an issue with Trade Hill too. Let me check out what he wrote. And he basically wrote that I have an issue with Trade Hill, but I have an idea to be able to con- connect uh, a local bank transfer company that could pull money out of someone's bank account and then the Trade Hill API and we can actually take a small fee off of it, but people can get credited almost instantly to their bank accounts from Trade Hill. And I said, well, that's pretty cool actually. Mm-hmm. So that was Bit Instant. Bit Instant essentially took money out of your bank account and then would just deposit it into your Bitcoin exchange account. But we it would take a few hours as opposed to a few days if you did it through us. And all it was was we would leave a lot of money on the exchange. And then when we would get, get paid from your bank account, we would transfer the money from our trade hill account to your trade hill account. Right. It's just an accounting thing at that point. Exactly. It was a database transfer and we would take a small, like 2% commission on it. And it, the volume went up pretty quickly. We were started doing a lot of business. So we did a few thousand dollars on our first day. And I said, wow, like there really is a need for this. Wow. And then we said, Let, let's go the next step. Let's add more exchanges. Let's add more processors. And eventually we had cash processors. So eventually we, we were doing in a, in, in a few months, we were doing a few hundred thousand dollars a day, a few hundred thousand dollars a day Wow! in, in uh, cash to Bitcoin or bank account to Bitcoin and, and vice versa. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I, I wasn't in Bitcoin back then, but talking to some of our mutual friends like Eric and Gabe, you know, they said that you could go into like a 7-Eleven and buy Walmart, Bitcoin as well. CVS, Dwayne Reed, yeah, Walgreens, you can go into... We had like over a million locations. I think TechCrunch did this, did the, the numbers for us, and they said that out of out of the thir- out of all the Bitcoin traffic, we were doing like thirty percent single handedly. We were doing thirty percent of all Bitcoin traffic, USD to Bitcoin volume on a given day. The, yeah, that that's ridiculous. I mean, I haven't heard a number like that since what Satoshi Dice used to do on the network. Oh yeah, exactly. Way, way back in the day. Um, so you started Bit Instant, and you know th- this is when the government started to snoop around and all that nonsense, and you went away for a while. But then you're back. You're back. You're back in. I mean, it must feel like the land of the free for you compared to what you had been. And you know your entrepreneurial mind 
is still going. Did did it ever stop? Did you ever stop thinking like an entrepreneur while you were in in prison? You know, it it didn't stop, but it in there to like have any side of business. So I just did a majority of watching, and I studied and became. I, I like to think somewhat more knowledgeable in socioeconomics and human behavior and how that affects uh, economics, microeconomics, macroeconomics, how basically how our behavior affects the way we save, spend, use money, what we believe is valuable. And I, and I personally believe that has more of a, uh, an effect on money than science does. You know, like modern day economics is all numbers and science and math and it takes a human factor out of it the economic schools of thought that are that the united states follows is all right we're going to you know legislate create laws and push buttons and levers and that'll affect and that'll affect how the american citizens use their money where in real economics it's the opposite it's how do you have Markets are efficient. Markets will always win. The more you try to control people and their money, the faster you're going to fail. I mean, history repeats itself. You look at countries. Countries, whenever they have economic issues, the first thing they do is capital controls. And the first thing they do is try to control the money. And when they do that, it just makes issues worse. It makes issues worse. So it does take the human element out of it. And that's one thing I really appreciated when first learning about Austrian economics is Mises's book, Human Action, like it was human exactly. acting or the reasons and incentives that humans act was so paramount that he named his treatise human action. It's so true. It's so true. And I saw that firsthand in, in prison. I saw, I saw crazy uh, economic theories being put into effect in there. And it's, it's crazy. Um, but by whom? Oh, just by, by the, by the inmates. I mean, I'll give you an example. So there's no, there's no currency in prison. Like there's, there's two markets. There's the administration run market and then the inmate run market. The administration run market is the commissary. So friends and family can why, you know, Western union or money grant you money. And you can, you can basically check your books and you can have a dollar amount on your books and that's how much you have. And then every Tuesday you can go shop in commissary. Uh, and there's a there's a list of things you can buy. So you basically get the commissary sheet day or two before. You fill out what you want. There's a set number of like maximums you can buy. So you can only buy up to certain you know a tuna packets. So you can only buy up to fourteen a week or whatever. Um, and you can only spend up to three hundred and sixty dollars a month in the commissary. And then that's it. So it's very restricted. Mm -hmm. So because of that, uh, a whole flourishing inmate run market kind of uh came to be and that's anything from i didn't participate but anyone can observe and can see they have you know people that even cut hair personal trainers cooks um right. people that did all these different things people i guess had their own uh, stores so wow they would sell commissary items at a premium because you can only go to commissary like once a week but there was no currency there was no way to transact there was no way you know what i mean Mm -hmm. So what the currency of the prison is the mackerel. So what the, it's all it is, is, is a little packet of mackerel fillets in uh, soybean oil. And there have been very, a lot of competing currencies in prison, but the mackerel packet has always succeeded because of a few reasons. Um, you look at the human factor, it has utility. You know, it's the, the mackerel is the best source of protein on the compound. Uh, it has a very long shelf life, uh, three years. You can eat it um, with anything. You can make rice, wraps. You can even put it on pizza. You know, it's the most widely consumed. Um, yeah, it's the most widely usable. You know, it's the most highly desired. So it's going to turn into currency. And you look, exactly. And you look at the human factor, everyone's willing to accept it. So because it's the most widely accepted, it becomes the, the currency. You look at from the economic side of it, it has a, a consumption rate. So there's, there's a certain amount of macro that's constantly being taken out of the uh, ecosystem every day but at the same time there's a there's a set inflation rate right that's the craziest thing that is every, so crazy there's, <laughs> there's 500 inmates on the compound every inmate so if you assume that out of 500 inmates every inmate is going to purchase the maximum amount of mackerel every sure. week that's 500 times 52 weeks times 14 mackerels that's your inflation rate it's preset 
It's crazy. So that's pretty cool too. And so that became the currency. And it's really cool because you know, things would, you know, like a haircut would cost you two max or whatever. But <laughs> what ended up happening was there are people that are in prison for, you know, years, right? Um, unfortunately. And they don't, they didn't like that their mackerels lose value after three years. So because that's what, the expiration uh, date. Exactly. After three years, the mackerel, you can't eat it anymore. It, it, it's really bad. It's, it's becomes like squishy and mushy and it, it right. becomes kind of toxic. You can't eat it anymore. So it loses the value of food, but it actually, it, it, it kept its transactional value. Like people were still using it as currency. So kind of two competing currencies came. There was food max that had a value of about a dollar 50. And then you had money max, which had a value of about a dollar. And money max were essentially macro packets that didn't that you couldn't eat. That is insane, Charlie. So, and actually, what had happened was there were uh, currency exchangers. There were people who would actually act as like you give me uh, two two money max, got you a, an eating mac. Crazy. Yeah, and just like that, the people's incentives, their natural incentives for what they're trying to pursue, money is created because it's it removes so much friction out of the market economy. People are just going to find things to use money. We don't want to have to barter. You know, this is still bartering if you break it down. It's just mackerel for a haircut or something. But the problem, the problem with barter, and I've always said this, and one of the reasons that Bitcoin has its value, I see it as a store of value. Problem with barter is that there's no, it, it's, you know, long-term savings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, for some reason, our, this, a lot of governments kind of discourage savings and they think that spending is, a, is, is one of the better economic incentives. We need people to spend more for the economy to jumpstart. But that actually isn't good. It's only good in, in good times, but in bad times, see, spending is bad because if people don't have savings, then if they lose their job or if something happens like an economic issue, um, everyone's out of work, right? Yeah. So you look at a company like Japan, which kind of incentivizes saving as well as spending. When the tsunami hit, you didn't see millions of people who lost jobs out on the street because the modern uh, Japanese citizen has a lot more savings than the modern American citizen. You look at, you look at like, I read a statistic yesterday that said that Almost half of New Yorkers are one paycheck away from homelessness. That is terrible. How crazy I mean, it, is that? It, it's insane. I mean, Paul Krugman and the entire Keynesian school of economics are just intellectually lazy with their ideas of digging holes and then paying someone else to fill it back exactly. up. Exactly. It's short-term economics versus long-term economics. We, we, yep. we want to have a short-term spending and everything's good now instead of building for the future. You look at Norway that, have a, that has a sovereign wealth fund. It's just, you need, you need something like that. You need, you, you know, it's absolutely it's, it's going to be laughed at in the history books eventually, but unfortunately right now there's too many incentives for governments to prefer this type of economic model because it fits exactly the money printing and, uh, low interest rate policies that they, that, that they need as the biggest debtor in the world. Charlie, let's come back to Bitcoin a little bit. You know, we were talking about how your economics degree really didn't give you any insight into the value of Bitcoin. Where did you first hear about Bitcoin? And what was the first thing, if you could remember, that really struck you as like, oh, wow, I really need to pay more attention to this. Before we hear what first got Charlie's attention about Bitcoin, I'd like to remind you that the team over at Exodus.io is looking to hire a JavaScript developer from a work from home position. So if this sounds like you, if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, then send them an email at founders at exodus.io. And maybe this could be a great opportunity for you to start building your own free and flexible lifestyle. Make sure and tell them that Ash from Liberty Entrepreneur sent you. And again, that's founders at exodus.io. Let's get back to the show. Where did you first hear about Bitcoin? And what was the first thing, if you could remember, that really struck you as like, oh, wow, I really need to pay more attention to this? As I went through my college years, I slowly discovered different schools of thought um, when it came to economics. And I started studying, studying those, uh, reading books and, and essays and traveling to countries that have different 
economic uh, kind of models. And I would study what was happening in Zimbabwe and things that, you know, in Nigeria uh, and Argentina, I was, I was what I was looking at those and like trying to understand why they happened. So I started to become more familiar with the Austrian school. And when I had discovered Bitcoin and I read the white paper, a lot of people saw different things in the white paper that Satoshi Nakamoto released. What I saw was, oh my God, this is hundreds of years of Austrian economic theory mm-hmm. being put into practice. Because one of the biggest complaints and arguments that you hear from people who are against the Austrian school of thought is they say, well, okay, it sounds great in theory, but in reality, it's not going to work because it's not tested and tried. So what we have now with Keynesian, it may not be the best, but it works to some extent. Right Now with Bitcoin, we finally, we can actually take it into practice and we're giving people two options. You know, we're not going to, we're not, we're going to use competition, right? We're going to say, okay, you have one system, which is what, what you've used all your life. And slowly, day by day, one person, adoption is a slow process. People are going to find out about Bitcoin and they're going to see they're going to see like, wow, this is something that's amazing. And they're going to maybe put some of their savings in Bitcoin or some of their transactions in Bitcoin. And slowly, by giving people the option, the better option, competition always wins out and markets are always efficient. And people will always decide on the better option. And Bitcoin is clearly the better option. Yeah. When I spoke at FinCon 2016, which is a financial conference here a couple months ago, and it wasn't a technical crowd. It wasn't a developer crowd. It was... You know, people with personal finance blogs. And I really thought hard about how to make Bitcoin appealing to this crowd. And one of the main areas I took, Charlie, was this is an opt in, opt out currency. Exactly. If you, you want to use it, you think it makes you better or helps your business or is faster, more affordable, more convenient, do it. Welcome. There's tons of people that'll help you. If you don't, that's fine. It's freedom of choice. That's fine too. I'm not into that whole like, you know, end the Fed all that stuff. I'm not into that. Like, you know, I don't want to end anything. I want to create and build and give people the opportunity. And if people like it, then great. You know, if, if they don't, then there's no harm against them. That's it. Yeah, that, that's that's the beauty of the entrepreneurial mindset. That is exactly what I'm trying to get across in this podcast, Charlie. Thank you for, for saying that. You got out of prison and very quickly you found a platform called Steam. You know, what what is Steam it and why did it attract you? So there are a lot of the, there are a lot of things that I like about the blockchain and one of them is its integrity it's its irreversibility and with bitcoin that's irreversibility of transactions um, everything that happens in the blockchain is set in there for time uh, for forever uh, when i had read about steam and it's a very long white paper steam was applying the blockchain to something that no one had ever even tried thought of before cuz typically everyone thought of uh, the blockchain technology as finance and money and, and things like that. Um, the guys behind Steam, Dan and Ned, said, why don't we take the blockchain and apply it to social media? And that seemed like an amazing idea because you can uh, write and post and publish to the Steam blockchain and your information is not only free for everyone to read, but it's distributed amongst the hundreds and, and thousands of of steam nodes around the world so it can't be erased it can't be deleted Uh, what what i also liked about steam was that it paid people for their content and it also paid people for their uh it also pays people for their engagement so you know we go on facebook and everything like that and we're just giving our data away Mm -hmm. on facebook and, and twitter and everything and that's that's fine but why not be paid for your for your content? Why not be paid for your work? And so like, you know, you look at Bitcoin and, and it's proof of work. And so you have miners that are using their electricity and that are investing their computers to audit and process transactions on the blockchain. Steam said, instead of, instead of having um, miners do that work, why don't we kind of have more of like a proof of brain? So the new money that gets created every day goes towards content creators and content curators. And so the, the inflation rate that is set, instead of going to like these miners, goes towards uh, people who write content and people who vote on content too. 
Yeah, it's really neat. You know, I interviewed Ned a couple of weeks ago, maybe even months ago at this point. But what I found the most interesting about Steam is it was a great way to show how blockchains can be programmed to incentivize certain types of actions. Yep. In Bitcoin, it incentivizes the miners. And for the most part, that's all. In the Steam blockchain, it incentivizes uh, content creators, engagement in a community, also something called a witness, which I don't know what that is that you, maybe you could tell us more, but you know, there's certain things that you can incentivize in dash you're incentivized to run a master node. It's yep. just, it's really neat how communities are starting to be built around blockchains to secure and protect and entrust their communications but also having an, a digital token available with a set inflation rate or an expected inflation rate to incentivize whatever you want to incentivize in your community. It's really, uh, really neat. Exactly. I, was so, I was so pleased whenever you came in on the scene in such a big way, Charlie, because you know, I, I see this type of technology going everywhere, like I, just blockchains everywhere, protecting and securing. And may, maybe it's just going to be derivatives, a side chain of like a big blockchain like Bitcoin. Sure. But, the ability to build and incentivize and get engagement in a community online with your own native currency is, man, that's a big step forward, isn't so it's, it? It's really, it's really great. And, and I'm really proud of Steam because, you know, the community spoke and said, we want to end, we want to make these changes. And one of those changes was ending hyperinflation. And there's a hard fork next week on December 6th that's going to essentially end the hyperinflation. And, and I'm not a fan of hyperinflation, so I'm really, I'm really happy about that. Um, so the new, the new hard fork is going to bring inflation down to about nine, nine and a half percent, which is similar to Bitcoin. And so out of that nine and a half percent, 15 percent of that goes towards steam power holders. Steam power holders essentially are long-term investors of the steam platform. So it's essentially buying steam cryptocurrency and then powering up. And then that protects you from, from the inflation. But instead of having a lockdown period of two years, they're actually changing that to only three months. Wow. So that kind of goes back to stop telling people what they can and cannot do with their money. And that's, I right. think that's really important. The, the other, removal of those capital controls will exactly. create more freedom. So they're removing capital controls and they're ending hyperinflation. That's a very important step because it's, it's, it's showing that, that, the, that the STEAM project, the experiment succeeded. It, it can exist and people are going to use it over the first six months. Now we have to kind of set our toes in and we have to start building long term. And nothing can be built long term with hyperinflation and capital controls. So I'm proud it's of tough. those guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm proud of those guys too. You know, that's that's where I really pushed back on Ned in the interview was, you know, I, I see how you're trying to put these capital controls on this hyperinflation, but when you have hyperinflation, it's always that it's always in the room. It's like the elephant in the room that you've got to make sure that you're taken care of. Otherwise, boom, your currency can go to zero. It'll be interesting to see the interest and capital come back into their currency once they have a, a more reasonable inflation rate. And I think it will because I think I think it will because it's a platform that people are using. So a lot of these kind of token offerings launch a product that promise to build a technology and nothing really comes of it. Steam has four or 5,000 active users every day and over 110,000 right. accounts. So uh, it's really a platform that people are creating content on and they're curating and there's a whole community and there's people using it. It's so hard to argue the success of Steam It. I know some people like Tone Vase will still argue that it's a scam, but it, it's hard to argue that Steam has it built is. a platform I mean, I understand and created his, a community. I, I understand his arguments and I've spoken to him on many occasions about it and I respect him immensely. Really like Tone, uh, you know, Courtney and I know, know him for a few years, but like you said, it's hard to argue that it's a scam when you go to the site and I write an article and I have dozens of real people commenting and engaging. It's, you, how are you supposed to do that? No one's forcing you to buy Steam. You know, you can earn just by posting good content or voting. You don't need to buy into it like one coin or, or any of those Ponzi schemes. So we see how blockchains are able to protect people's engagement with each other and the content that we create and you know distribute it to all the nodes around the world and you know when we're when there's this crusade against fake news i think that blockchains are going to be very important for communities to be able to secure their content uh, so it doesn't get ruled out or overwritten or banned or something like that but let's talk about how 
Bitcoin and specifically the Bitcoin blockchain allows people to protect their money without needing banks. It's an unbelievable store of value. You don't need to rely on banks instead of keeping money under your mattress. You know, you, you can be your own bank and many people opt to do that. Many people will keep money in banks, but at the same time want to keep a few thousand dollars in their Bitcoin wallet. That's super secure. Um, and it, it empowers you because what are your options, right? It's either keep money in a bank. And when you put, when you deposit money into a bank, you know, you don't really own that money anymore. You're just loaning, you're technically loaning that money to the bank and the bank reloans it out to other people, Who, whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever. And we've seen in the past that they don't always make the best decisions on who to loan money out to. So, I mean, I don't know what the reserve rate is now, but they only require to keep like 10% you know, in assets and cash of what they actually, uh, have on deposit. Yeah. Let's hope that 11% person doesn't come and want their cash out of the bank. Uh, that's when things can get scary. You know, I have, I still actively consult in and work in the offshore banking space. And one trend I'm noticing that I've seen from some of my, my partners is that the offshore space is really dwindling right now. And the demand for offshore corporate structures and, you know, all that is, is being replaced by cryptocurrencies. And that's what they're yep. saying. And yep. it's really interesting to see even mainstream people like this well, start, it, start seeing the replacement of the offshore banking sector. And, and, and it's okay to have competition. I mean, there's still, you, you know, people are like banks are evil. Well, they're not, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I use credit unions personally myself and there are, there are things that banks do better than Bitcoin currently does right now. When I need a car loan, you know, if I want to buy a car and I don't have that kind of money on hand, that's a good use for a bank. I mean, even a mortgage and things like that. But it now forces competition and competition is good. And now they have to become better at it and offer better competing rates. And then eventually someone will come and, and create a mortgage system on the Bitcoin network, maybe even a smart contract. So you don't, you don't know. So let's talk about your current project, Charlie, IntelliSense Capital. What is that and where did you get the idea? I've always been a, a fan of bridging the old world and the new world together. And a lot of companies I've noticed, like Midwestern, um, kind of heartland American companies, don't really know how to uh, engage blockchain technology. So, um, and then the other side, the idea was, well, how do you, you know, we have blockchain tech, it exists, it's been around for a few years. Instead of trying to like, you know, build something more that may or may not actually come. What can we do today? What 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 can we um, do today that will apply the use of the current technology that we have? And um, I was approached to this idea by my co-founder Jason Granger, and he said, "Well, I want to do private equity on the blockchain." And that was a really cool idea because what his idea was: why don't we actually sell shares of a of a portfolio of companies on the blockchain? And it's going to be completely liquid and traded on exchanges so people can buy and sell the token within seconds. And that'll represent ownership in a dozen companies. And these companies are stable, middle market American companies that have been around for a long time and making profit. So you're actually having it. It's a securitized asset. It's, it's the first kind of token that's legitimately backed by hard assets. Mm -hmm. And... So that was on one side of it, and that was really cool. But I'm like, let's take it to the next level. We have these companies. These companies are owned by Bitcoiners or Ethereum token holders or whatever. And we're paying out dividends, and the companies are making money. Now let's go to these companies that we own, and let's commission a report. Let's get the Bitcoin community's input, and let's figure out how can blockchain tech either cut costs for these companies or make them more money. And then what we do is we either buy that Bitcoin company or blockchain company or do a joint venture and we kind of force that marriage. Right. So basically you're adding value to the companies that you're also selling shares of. Exactly. Because of your experience in the blockchain space, you can come into that company and say, all right, well, you're doing this well and this not so well. And, oh, okay, we can improve this by integrating exactly. blockchain. We are intelligent fund management. So mm. we're not just private equity, where we're buying and flipping companies. We're buying companies that have been around a while. We want to keep them around. We want to keep them making money, but we want to intelligently using technology, uh, empower them and grow them. 
because yeah. that's you know that's that's what we do. That's what I've always done. Yeah, and I'm a, what are I'm, you, a, what... I'm a crusader for a new, better tech-driven society. And however I need to do it, I'll do it via competition and opt-in. Exactly. When do you expect this project to uh, to be launched, or when when can people start expecting to be able to invest in with this? So we are looking in January fifteenth to launch our token sale, and we're going to be selling tokens. Whatever we don't sell, we're burning. So we're not, you know, there's no like fifty percent pre mine or that we're holding on to. Uh, we're selling shares, and whatever doesn't get sold, but we hope to sell out. Uh, we're selling a thirty percent ownership stake in all of our companies. So by buying one token you're buying a percentage share in all of the companies, not just one mm. or two of them in all of them. We already have right. two companies under purchase agreement that we're ready to purchase as soon as the fund starts. And if dividends or such get paid, if it cash flows, is that going to be paid out in crypto as well? It happens on chain. It's a smart mm. contract that we built oh, right. that will pay okay. our dividends right on the chain. That That's great, Charlie. That's, that, that's really wonderful. It, we've got to start giving some of these monolithic institutions some more competition, you know, the, the banking sector, um, how securities are currently owned or not owned. Um, you know, with the blockchain tech, you can definitively say, yes, I control this share or this group of shares of these companies because I can move it around. I could send it to you if I want. I'm not going to, but I could, as opposed to how uh, shares are currently held by the big institutions. You don't really own your shares. They're lending them out. And it's just very risky right now. So I, I wish you really all the best in that, Charlie. We need it to preserve our value and to keep control of our assets because I I fear that there is a, a, a big reshift and awakening happening, uh, not only with securities, but how people view and see money and why money really does have value. It's not because it's green and has a couple certain stamps and a pyramid on the back. It's because it's you can trust it and it has utility. Um, exactly. Let's start winding down, Charlie. I'd like to ask you two more questions. The first one is, how has being an entrepreneur created more freedom in your own personal life? You know, people trust in the political process to um, preserve their freedoms. And that's, that's fine. You know, I'm not gonna, gonna come and tell you that you're wrong. But I will tell you that the way I see it, the real ways to preserve your freedoms and to practice them is by being an entrepreneur because there are many ways that you can build companies, you can build software to preserve freedom of speech, uh, freedom of technology, freedom of, of economics, uh, freedom of religion, uh, all different freedoms. By being an entrepreneur and building a company, those freedoms written into stone by providing the people with the technology to actually practice those freedoms. You are doing one of the best things you can for the, for the society. Beautifully said, Charlie, you know, entrepreneurs are trying to make a better world by solving pains. And, you know, I, that's exactly what I'm trying to do here is this mindset isn't very commonly learned during our childhoods or even our no. adolescence. And, you truly are doing one of the best things. Solving other people's problems is one of the best things you can do to create a freer society, giving people more options, and that does create freedom. The last question I've got for you, Charlie, is you've built a lot of businesses. You've had very successful times and very difficult times. To someone who is maybe starting a new digital business or someone who currently has one, what advice do you have for someone, especially about the necessity for perseverance fail fail it's okay to fail because behind every success there are a dozen failures if, if someone comes to you and said that i've succeeded in everything i've ever done they're lying to you because it's okay to fail some of the best things that people have ever done they've done by learning from their mistakes if you're if you remove your fear of failing then you can do anything that you want to do in the world. Charlie Shrem, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you and all the awesome things that you're building and doing to create a freer society. If my audience would like to get in touch with you or contact you or just keep up to date with you, what's the best way to do that? Twitter. Just follow me at Charlie Shrem on Twitter. 
All right, Charlie. Well, is there anything we didn't cover that you'd like to go over? I think you got everything. Thanks, Charlie. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. Our Facebook social community, the Liberty E Tribe, is growing every single week with digital entrepreneurs who are looking to build their own freedom. If this sounds like something you're interested in, then head on over to our Facebook page. I'll leave the link in the show notes. Until next time, you know what to do. Keep building freedom. <laughs>